1865, Jefferson Davis is in Richmond, Virginia. Starts in Richmond, Virginia, and you can see that his trek is quite lengthy. We're talking about a 38-day trek. Now, 38 days today sounds like a long time, but you've got to understand when he left Richmond on April the 2nd, that train didn't go more than maybe 10 or 12 miles an hour. It was very slow. It took a long time to get here, and it took a long time to go down. And then he went my wagon, and then he went my horse, and he stayed places. This was kind of an extended trip that he kind of made it longer than it should be. When we looked at this last November, we were in the offices of the Civil War Trust, and we were talking about the end of the war. And one of the directors came up and said, you should do that. And Carol, my wife, looked at me and said, well, why don't you? And I said, I can't come up with a reason. So here we are today on the second leg of this wonderful trip. So we've gone the first two steps. We've gone from Richmond to Danville. And you can see that the trip's going to continue. We're going to go to Greensboro. We're going to go to Charlotte. We're going to go to Abbeville. We're going to go to Irwinville. And then we're going to circle back around to Fortress Monroe. And that's really important because it closes the loop. It goes from president in the Capitol to chained, imprisoned inmate. In 38 days, the trip lasts another 12 days, and all of a sudden you have a captive prisoner under the United States of America. And a lot of things happen during this trip, which I want to share with you as we go forward. Next slide, please. This is a picture of Jefferson Davis shortly after he was captured or released. And what he has on here is a gray suit and a hat. This is the same outfit that he wore when he was in Danville. When he left Richmond, I don't believe there were too many changes of clothes, but if there were, he was pretty succinct in what he wore. Gray suit, black boots, and a broad brim hat. This depicts Jefferson Davis probably after the war. As he was coming to Danville, he would have looked much younger. Remember that this is after an imprisonment of two years in captivity. But again, look at the statue. There's no slump, and there's nothing to represent that what he's been through. Now, he's 52 when he gets elected. He's 58, almost 59, when he gets captured. He's 61 when he's released. He's 63 when he finally gets his full release. Today, if you look at every president, you look at every president in the last 20 years that has assumed that position, from Bill Clinton to Obama today, when they were elected, they looked wonderfully young. <laughs> and when they get out, they look like somebody hit them with a hammer. Eight years of the presidency will do that. Imagine what Jefferson Davis went in four years. And I'm going to allude to some of the things that happened to him along his trip so you can refresh that. So let's start. Richmond, April the 2nd. What's Jefferson Davis doing? This is a Sunday. Jefferson Davis is in church. He's at St. Paul's Cathedral. As he's walking to the church, he receives a telegram from General Lee saying, the lines of Petersburg are broke. I am going to retreat. That defense of Richmond is gone. He continues on to church, goes to his pew, sits, and he prays. And before communion, another sexton comes up with the second telegram that he gets that day. And this one says, it's time. The lines are broken. I'm moving on. Lee's telling people, I'm gone. You need to prepare to leave the capital. Davis gets up and solemnly walks out the church <clears throat> to the White House, the Confederacy. So on Thursday, at 11.30 in the morning, at St. Paul's, we're in that pew. I'm sitting there at the same time that he was. There were 600 people in that church reflecting on this moment. It was not only about the moment, but it was about Richmond. But how many people here have the opportunity to go somewhere where your descendant was 150 years ago and sit in the same place on that historic moment? Meaningful. But what did it tell me? What did I feel? The first thing I felt is that what was the most important thing to him that day? It was his religion. It was his allegiance to God, his thankfulness to God for everything that God had given. That's an important characteristic of Davis that a lot of people miss. They want to construe him as something that's nasty and, and, and evil and whatever, not knowing that he 
is a devout Christian that has a strong religious background. And he was not going to let the movement of the Lord get in the, role, in the way of his worship service at St. Paul's. So we get up and we leave that church, and where do we go next? Well, Richmond in 1865 looks a lot like this. St. Paul's is there, it's dirt. He goes to the White House of the Confederacy, and he's starting to move things. Now, somebody's going to ask, hey, well, what's, what's his family doing? Is he thinking about them? Well, he had thought about them. Matter of fact, they had come through here four days before that. He had taken his wife and their four, five kids, I'm sorry, five kids, and put them on a train so they would be safe from all this that's coming. And they've come through here, got Gainsborough almost to Charlotte by now. And so they're on his mind, but he's given them that release. So they're not going to be attached to him no matter what happens. Again, the fear of capture and whatever comes along. And one of the things that he tells Marina is he gives her a derringer. And he says to her, if you need to use this, do so. What did he mean? Not to shoot the guy that's going to capture him, but to take her own life to protect her from those evils that might portray the first leader of the Confederate States of America. So that left. So he's not so much concerned about that. He goes to the White House and does the last minute items that he's trying to protect from the White House. Meanwhile, the train's being loaded. It's supposed to leave at like 6. It doesn't leave at 8. It doesn't leave at 10. It leaves sometime after midnight. And this is not a very big train. But it's got the treasury in it. It's got all these records in it. It's got books. It's got all the stuff that they wanted to keep. Because remember, if you're elected president, you're a president until there is no presidency. Either you pass it on to the next successor, or you're president until the country fails to exist. Davis does not ever back off from the responsibility given to him by the country that he represents. Everyone says, well, you know, it's over. Not to him. It's not over until it's over, in a lot of respects. And if you look at presidents, that's what they should do. Now, you see this today when you see these dictators' flocks, and you see all that. Dictator is a little bit different than an elected president of a country. But Davis also has a historic belief that's inside of him. He has this strength that he's going to say, I am president, and I'm going to remain president. I'm going to represent the country that has been given to me long before after I leave. So he gets to Richmond. They leave Richmond on the train. Next slide. And this is the locomotive that pulls the train. Now, I'm sure you all have done some, heard something about the railway back in this day and age, but it wasn't great. And then, matter of fact, it was, you could sometimes walk faster than the train could go. And it took a long time to get here. He got here, I think, sometime in the early afternoon. He didn't leave it. Up. So it's not going very fast, but the train does finally get to Danville. He does get off and go up. And gracious, the city of Danville's gracious. They open up the city to him. The settlement say, please come stay at home. And so he does. The cabinet comes along with him. They have several meetings in the settlement house. And Danville's one of those exceptional places it's always been termed the last capital of the Confederate States of America because it was the last time that the entire cabinet met, or that, that remnant of it. Greensboro could probably say that, and so can Charlotte. But for Danville to say that, I learned that when I was here last in the 80s, I've always maintained that Danville's the last capital of the Confederate States of America because you all have coined that phrase. I don't want to change something that I believe is here. As he is in Danville, though, he gets bad news. He gets Lee's news. Lee is going, is going to surrender. And it's a very difficult time for him. He sees his armies slowly dissipate. But he's not willing to recognize that it's over because he's still president. There's still Confederate States of America. It hasn't been his family. So he's in comfort. He has a great place to stay. He has his cabinet with him. But still, he doesn't get any good news. Nothing good happens to him other than here he is in this marvelous house in the city of Danville and he's supporting her. After staying here for this period of time, he elects to move on. Because it's getting hot, things are starting to change. Lee's surrendered. They're starting to work for Davis. It's kind of one of those things. 
So he goes on, and the next visit is to Greensboro, North Carolina. This is the, the selling house. You've all seen that. That's, this is for some people that have never been here before, but I hope you've all gone to the museum. And if you're not, I encourage you to do that. Next slide, please. In Greensboro, he comes, and Greensboro is a little bit different than this wonderful <coughs> town of Danbury. Matter of fact, they don't want Davis. There's no bones about it. The train pulls in and they're saying, nobody wants to put you up, nobody wants to put you up your cabinet up. We're scared. They're scared that the union's going to find out that somebody put him up while he was here and they're going to burn his house down. Now, Greensboro's an interesting place because when we announced we were coming to Danville, all of a sudden I get all the support. The school supports us, the museum supports us, the DC, the SED, everybody's here doing it. Greensboro's still a little bit tenuous of me coming. So we're still going and we're going to have a few meetings, but nothing like to this, 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 this extent, which is my effort to say, you know, some things just mean they'll change. I don't know, but Greensboro is one of those things. But he does go to Greensboro, and this is where he was, and then stayed in the cabinet. And again, Greensboro claims the last capital at the end. Next slide. Greensboro is a very short visit. The cabinet actually stays on the train for four days. It's raining, it's horrible weather, it's that April spring shower, it's just horrible. They move on to Charlotte, and again, it's transformation. The city of Charlotte opens their arms. They say, oh, we're glad to see you. What can we do for you? They offer him a wonderful place to stay. The cabinet's diminishing now, slowly. But in Greensboro, something dramatically happens, too. The mode of transportation changes. It goes from train to horseback and wagons. And so in Greensboro, many of the records were left. And a year and a half ago, we were fortuitous. We had a benefactor who discovered one of the books that was left in Greensboro. It's a, a book that documents all the promotions of the officers in 1863. It's a straight from Greensboro. And we have it today in the end. We're taking it to Greensboro to show them in Charlotte, whatever, and we're actually going to bring it to the museum this afternoon to show it to them. So Charlotte is here, but the mode of transportation's changed, although it's still a delightful place in reference to the hospitality and everything that's going on. But Charlotte is not a good place for Davis for a couple of reasons. As you all know, Lincoln went to Ford's Theater John Wilkes both assassinates Lincoln and he dies the next day. Davis is in Charlotte, doesn't know any letters, but everything by now is not good. Lee's gone, Johnson's almost gone, the army's disbanded, whatever, he's kind of plotting his way. And also he's catching up with his wife. His wife's about four days ahead of him. She had been in Charlotte for a long time and treated very well. They, they, they took her in and, and, and he was pleased to hear about all the things. He was still communicating back and forth with Marina trying to figure out where they're going to meet. But something happens in Charlotte that changes the entire picture. To now, it's, I'm trying to just move along, I'm trying to go where I need to go, I'm still president of the Confederate States of America, and whatever, everything's kind of come as it comes. He gets the telegram, however, that announces Lincoln has been assassinated. Now to him, it's a devastating thing, but he doesn't react as devastated as he felt inside if you read after the fact, the comments and the discussions. He knows that changes the whole game. Remember, when Lincoln went to Richmond on April the 4th, today, Lincoln is in Richmond. He's at the first White House of the Confederacy. He's sitting at Jefferson Davis's desk. And they ask him, what are you going to do with all these Confederates, especially Jefferson Davis? And he says, let them off easy. Be merciless. Don't let them be mercy, give them mercy, give them kindness, let's let bygones be bygones. Lincoln's idea was, the quicker we get over this, the better we're going to be. The better that we incorporate the southern country back into the United States, as easy as we can make it, the better it will be. His assassination changed everything 180 degrees. And it would for us today, if one of our presidents was assassinated by some other country that say it was Canada, 
we would look at Canada and want to destroy the Canadian government and everything associated with it. Well, Lincoln's Secretary of War was a general by the name of Stanton. And Stanton always had an edge about the South. He didn't like him even before he was in there. But this gave him reason. Reason to hang Jefferson Davis from a tall oak tree. And Dan Stanton, on the next day, publicly associates Davis with the assassination. The Northern press grabs it up. And for weeks after this event, even to the point of a month, they're running front page articles saying Jefferson Davis is responsible for the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. So what happens to Davis in the viewpoint of the North? He goes just a flighting president to what? The most wanted man in America. $100,000 wanted for the assassination of Lincoln. No truth to the deal, nothing at all. Matter of fact, there's four or five people in Washington, D.C. that are saying, yes, we were in Montreal and we saw telegrams and we saw letters and all this, and they're making all this up. They're feeding the press. The press is not checking any of this. Remember the frenzy to get rid of everybody that's associated with this that assassination is just running out of control. It's just, it's almost as though when we had 9-11, do you remember the anger and everybody came together and we were going to do this. This is the same thing, but it was all coming from the media. It wasn't anything that anybody saw or knew for their own self. They're all getting this thing secondhand, and the media controlled the population back then, and it was very simple for them to say Jefferson Davis was implicated in the assassination of Davis. So now he's a fugitive, wanted, $100,000 bond on his head. Gave it to all the armies saying, hey, go get this guy. Can you imagine this? Now, $100,000 is about $4.5 million today. If somebody put $4.5 million on my head, there'd be a lot of people working for me too, dead or alive, absolutely. So think of that. So he also wraps up the army. And it's an interesting person, the first one that's notified to go find Jefferson Davis is a general by the name of Palmer, William J. Pennsylvania infantry or whatever. And they're in northern North Carolina. So he sends a telegram to William J. Palmer, and he says, go get Davis. So Palmer starts looking, and as he starts to ask questions, he's found that Davis is already migrating to the south, and he can't find him. I'm going to tell you that story for a good reason down the road. You're going to connect back to William J. Palmer in one of the most amazing stories you've heard. So Davis comes to Charlotte, he learns of this, now he's a fugitive. So what happens? What's he thinking about now? Is he thinking about his escape? Or is he thinking, you know what? I might want to see my family one more time because I might not live through this. I don't know that. But if it's me and all of a sudden the, the role's reversed, I'm going to think, who's the most important thing I want to do in my life? If I'm going to die from this, at least I want to see my family. There's numerous conversations and telegrams and letters behind the scene between Verena, but he's talking about go to Abbeville or Washington, Georgia. That's where he wants her to be. She's already moved him south, and there's this, and I, I, I'm fascinated by the fact that he can still telegraph and write letters. There are couriers going back and forth, so he kind of knows where she's at that way. He lives in Charlotte, and he goes to the next wonderful town just south, Abbeville, oh, this is, I'm sorry, here's the, there's a stone in Charlotte, and that's where we're going to be. We're going to stand on that, that very spot. You know, I want to re recreate this, and how do I feel when I would have been just an escape person to the number one wanted man in America? I can't even imagine the pressure that must have been on top of him and how he looked at things. Next slide. And Charlotte, you know, wasn't a very big town back then. It was probably about, looks like about 15,000 people. Sure, how big it was, but it's very small. One other fact I learned the other day is that when Richmond became capital of the Confederate States of America, there was about 40,000 people. I don't know how many of you know, but when the, the United States was formed, Richmond or Virginia was the biggest state by far in the population. And Richmond was already a huge town by that time. So it was big, but as the war went on, you know how it went to 120 people, three times the growth in Richmond, one of the largest 
cities in America during the war. Things like that. Jefferson then takes his wagons and his horses and they go to Abbeville, South Carolina. Again, they're out with open arms. They're, but the, the cabinet's diminished. And by now, there's about three, maybe four. His cadre has shrunk. He started in Richmond with maybe 4,000. He got to Greensboro, and there's probably about 1,000 or less. By the time he gets to Abbeville, it's in the hundreds. His entourage is shrinking rapidly. His cabinet members are, are leaving. They're resigning because they can see that this is going to go on. This isn't stopping. And everybody asks me, you know, Davis was a slight man. He was six foot tall. But how much did he weigh? Maybe he weighed 160 in his fist. If you turn sideways, you miss him. But he had ridden horses every day of his life. Remember, in his childhood, he went from Mississippi to West Point. He went from Mississippi to Wisconsin. When he was about 12, his father sent him on a horse with one slave from Woodville, Mississippi to Lexington, Kentucky. As a matter of fact, Samuel, his father, didn't tell Jane that he'd been gone. And Jane's looking around for him for about three days and finally asked him what happened. Well, I sent him to school. Where? Lexington, Kentucky. Now, the mothers, can you imagine that happening today? He was 10 children. But it's one of those phenomenal stories. So he was used to this. This is nothing to him. This trip is like you and I walking across the street to get a cup of coffee at Starbucks. This is what he's used to be doing. Abbeville again, next slide. But this is where he stays, the Burke, uh, Burke Mansion. We're going to be there in two, two days. And we're going to see Charlotte, and we're going to be able to, I mean, Abbeville, and see this wonderful town. They also have a, 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 a program plan for me to tell about. But now, Abbeville is a very key point because now he's escaping. He's changed his realm. He says, look, I've got to get rid of this stuff. I mean, you've only got rid of a lot of games while in Charlotte, but now I've got to figure this out. So from here, all I had to do is to turn left, go to the water, get on a boat, and be gone. No. Again, remember what I told you. Once this most wanted came around him, he then wanted to see his family one more time. So he's after them. He's chasing them. And they're ahead of him. And he's looking for them. Now, they've been to Abbeville. He stays in Abbeville for a few days. And then he starts his trip. And he continues south. Next slide, please. To Irwinville, Georgia. Now, the day before he gets to Irwinville, he meets his family in Washington, Georgia. They all get together. I'm reading these things about how this happens. And it's not a plan. There's nobody sitting there saying, I'm going to meet you here at this time. They're not texting one another. They're not cell phoning one another. Not, there's no communication. So when I look at this, I say, what, what is it that happened here? Well, Davis wanted to see him. Garina wanted to see him. They're both rid of this. So, you know, God probably interceded and said, this is the time that we're going to let you get together. We're going to let you see your family one more time before what's about to happen is going to happen. I'm a very religious person. I believe I'm standing here because God gave me the last name and the ability to speak. And I can't write. My wife wants me to write a book. If we do, none of you are going to read it. But she might write it and you might read it. But I can talk about Jefferson Davis from the viewpoint of what I see. So here he is with his family together, all together, all kids, his wife, and they go to Irwinville, Georgia that night and they set up camp. Very next morning, early in the morning, the Union Cavalry, the Michigan and Wisconsin Cavalry show up, and there's a, a bright, brief firefight, and they're actually shooting at one another. Finally, they call that off. They come in, and Davis hears the commotion and comes out of the tent. As he comes out of the tent, it's one of those kind of dewy, moist May mornings. Not really cold, but just damp. Marina, throws the shawl around his shoulder to protect him. And he walks out of the tent, he's walking away, and he's stopped by a union on a horseback saying, who are you, or whatever the case. And at that point in time, he's recognized as President of the United States of America. Now, Davis, remember, is a military man. He went to West Point, 
He was in Black Hawk Wars. He was in War of 1847, the Secretary of War. He knows how to defend himself, and he's about to do that. And Verena rushes in between him and this Union soldier for fear that Davis is going to try to defend himself. And the minute he does, he's going to be dead. And the only reason that he's not dead is that he had met his family the day before, and Verena was there to protect him from his own best interests. Else, if you would read today, Jefferson Davis shot in the road in Hill, Georgia. I'm, I'm guaranteeing that would have been the headline, but it wasn't. He's captured in Irwinville, Georgia. The Michigan and the Wisconsin, and it's, it's ironic the stories that come out. Remember, he's already been attached to the wonderful assassination of Lincoln. He was there in, in, in Force Theater while he was on his trip, obviously, according to that. But now he's got another thing he's got to live by. The depiction of Jefferson Davis when he's captured. And I'm going to show you some of the political cartoons here in a minute that were demonstrative in reference to trying to reduce Jefferson Davis to a frail, insignificant, afraid person. Because that's the only way they could do it. They wanted to demean him. Next slide. He's taken from there. The whole family's taken to Macon. They get on a boat called the Savannah. They're down the river. They go up to Fortress Monroe. Now, one thing that happens at the capture that you don't know about is I mentioned there's five kids. There's four of his family, and there's an adopted 